This is Ham College, Episode 40, for April 30th, 2018. Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. Spring is in the air, and it's time to check out ICOM's line of D-Star radios. And by hamstudy.org, a great way to study for your next license exam. Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Ham College. I'm Professor Thomas. And I'm Dean Martin. And it's good to be back with you again. Uh, Dean Martin, you, you're you singing a little flat tonight. What's... Yeah, I'm a little flat. I'm uh, We're stretching the rubber band out tonight. I'm actually in Seattle, Washington this evening. Um, anyway, for work. So we're doing another one of these remotely. So hopefully it'll go fairly smooth. The last one worked out okay. Yeah. Uh, if if my uh, iPad would just stay on over here and I could see what's going on in the chat room. Uh, it has been, well, it's been springtime here and the pollen is out. I, uh, I'm feeling the effects. I think you're feeling the effects out there on the West Coast, too. I surely am. Uh, we've got, um, well... I guess first thing we should do is mention the fact that anytime we're shooting a show live, we've got a chat room going on, amateurlogic.tv slash chat. You can join all your rowdy friends in there and uh, and have a good time. And we'll be looking at it throughout the show to kind of see if we're getting the answers right or not. It, it's going to be an interesting show. We've got... Uh, uh, well, a resumption of topics we talked about last time, sort of, we're, we're continuing on. What did we talk about last time, Tommy? You know, that's a really good question. Uh, it could have been about the uh, Ready code set. The uh, Yeah, the Vera codes. Yep. It could have been about something like that. Yep. I, I think we probably talked about um, part two of digital modes. So we've got more digital modes for you tonight. We also talked about RFI and, uh, you know, getting rid of some types of interference. So more digital tonight, part three of that. And we're going to jump off into HF antennas. So it'll be the first time we've talked about that topic. Some of the, Yeah, that should be interesting. Uh, there's there's going to be a few challenging questions on there related to that. I, I did see the... The question pools, but not really the answers. So, uh, should be interesting. Yeah, uh, very challenging questions tonight. I am expecting that uh, the chat room is going to have as rough a time with them tonight as as we probably will. I can only say I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> get your buzzers ready. Uh, you're probably going to need them tonight. Well, I guess uh, that's all I've got here. If you are ready to get to rolling, we'll jump right on in, Tommy. I'm ready. This is going to be kind of a challenge because my camera's over there, but all the action is over there. So, um, anyway. Well, turn one eye that way and one that yeah. way. <laughs> I've, I've been trying that. Yeah. I will, I'll probably look like, what's his name? Marty Feldman on yeah. Young Frankenstein. Yeah. Time it's over. <laughs> okay. How is an FSK signal generated? That's FSK means frequency shift keying. Is it A, by keying an FM transmitter with a subaudible tone? B, by changing an oscillator's frequency directly with a digital control signal. Uh, C, by using a transceiver's computer data interface protocol to change frequencies. Or D, by reconfiguring the CW keying input to act as a tone generator. So, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and, and rule out D right now because we're not reconfiguring any inputs. No. Uh, transceivers, 
computer data. Well, first of all, FSK, that's frequency shift keying. Um, mm -hmm. We talked about that. I, I think it was in the last one. If not, it was one before. Pretty sure it was the last one, though. Um, so that's frequency shift keying. So let's, we ruled out D. C is user transceivers computer data interface to change frequencies. Well, that does change frequencies, but um, that doesn't seem right. Uh, B, changing an oscillator frequency directly with a digital control signal. I'm thinking that's going to be the answer, but let's check A. By keying an FM transmitter with a subaudible tone. So I'm I'm going to go with B on that one by changing an oscillator frequency to directly, or I'm sorry, changing an oscillator's frequency directly with a digital control signal. So we're going to change the oscillator frequency. But that's, that should be the answer. All right. I'm going to agree with you. And the people in the chat room who guessed, not a lot of them uh, threw their answer out there, but the ones who did all said it was a B. And it was by changing an oscillator's frequency directly with a digital control signal. Let me uh, fess up here and say that that answer really threw me off when the uh, first time I read over that because they didn't, you'd almost could think that the oscillator they're talking about is the one that controls the frequency of the radio, but that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about an audio oscillator's frequency. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, it could, could be a little misleading there, so you want to read those questions carefully. But, uh, hey, most everybody, uh, well, everybody got that one who, who threw an answer out there. So apparently it wasn't as hard as I thought it was. Yeah, but there are plenty more coming up that are. All right, well, let's, let's try this one then. Okay. What is the relationship between transmitted symbol rate and bandwidth? A, symbol rate and bandwidth are not related. B, higher symbol rates require wider bandwidth. Or C, lower symbol rates require wider bandwidth. Or D, bandwidth is always half the symbol rate. Well, you know, I think this is a, a pretty easy one right here, and I'm noticing everybody in the chat room is agreeing with the answer. I think it is. Uh, let's just start at the bottom there. D, bandwidth is always half the symbol rate. No, I mean, you can't go by that because the symbol rate could be different for different modes of uh, digital communications. Uh, C, the lower symbol rates require wider bandwidth. That would be kind of crazy. You know, you'd think the, the more data you were trying to ship, the higher the symbol rate you would need, and therefore the more bandwidth. I mean, it costs cost more money, costs, you know, more bandwidth. Right, just, just like your Internet connection. Yeah, so you, you can rule out A as well. Symbol rate and bandwidth are not related, no. They are. So I say uh, B, higher symbol rates require wider bandwidth. Everybody got that one right over in the chat room. Yeah, that, that one's pretty, uh, Yeah. Uh, I want to say easy, but, you know, if you're familiar with any digital stuff at all, you kind of understand the relationship there. Yep. Yeah. Okay, well, I've got another one for you. <laughs> all right, hit me. What, and these are getting a little tougher now. What is the maximum symbol rate permitted for RIDI or data emission transmissions on the 20 meter band? Is it A, 56 kilobaud? B, 19.6 kilobaud? Uh, C, 1200 baud? Or, three, or D, 300 baud? You may as well go ahead and get that buzzer out here because I'll be honest with you, I don't really know the answer to this one. So it's just going to be a guess. 20 meter band. You know, I'm just going to go with the one that seems to make sense because I, I really don't know, honestly. 56 kilobaud seems pretty high for that for uh, HF. 
and so does 19.6. So I'm going to go with C, 1,200 baud. I, I, I honestly really don't know. Well, I, I'm probably going to get buzzed right here. Over in the, the chat room, they're kind of split on it. There's some there's some C's in there, and then there's a couple of D's. Uh, I happen to know the answer because I saw the questions earlier. Uh, uh, oh, that's not fair. Well, it's just... <laughs> I know, you got to type them in. Yeah. Uh, so, I don't know. They're, they're, they're kind of mixed in the chat room. I know what the answer is, though. Uh, get your buzzers ready, because it's D. 300. I know bottom. some of the bands have different different uh, data rates on there, but and I, I don't memorize them. I can't remember them. I honestly don't even remember if they were on the test when I took it. You know, I it's don't. It's been so long. I don't remember seeing them on there, but I think, yeah, there's bound to have been some of them. But here's here's Professor Thomas's clues on how to kind of remember this, and I'll probably miss the next question, so you know, <laughs> and lose all my street cred right there. But the lower the frequency, generally, the um, the lower the baud rate. Yeah, and I, yeah, that and that kind of makes sense in my mind. Uh, but I don't know where the points where the points are where they change. Oh, we'll be finding out here in just a minute. Yeah, the hard way. Yeah. So um, yeah, down on the twenty meter band, three hundred baud, and below that, uh, you know, all the bands below that are going to be three hundred baud. Uh, yeah. So yeah, and just because we missed these, you know, that we haven't studied these. I haven't seen this stuff in forever. Yeah. So kind of like we were saying earlier, um, it, it seems almost unfair that we should be able to study on it. But I guess that would make it pretty boring, and it wouldn't be a test of yourself on how much uh, how much you remember. Well, no, it wouldn't that way. But I mean, anyone who's going to take the exam, we we suggest that you study. I suggest yeah. you study for yeah. sure. Um, three hundred. Hopefully, baud. that's why you're here. Yeah, three hundred uh, baud. That's roughly you'll be able to transmit stuff mm, just a little faster than you can type. Typically, uh -huh. so y you couldn't, you wouldn't really want to send a. A ton of data that way, and that's why when you uh, look at the digital modes on uh, the lower HF bands there, you're going to see the data coming through just about the speed that somebody would type. Yeah, my first computer modem was 300 baud. Mine too. What is the maximum symbol rate permitted for RIDI or data emissions transmitted at frequencies below 28 megahertz? A, 56 kilobaud. B, 19.6 kilobaud. C, 1,200 baud. Or D, 300 baud. Well, this is a little higher frequency. 28 megahertz, that's going to be in the 10 meter band. And let's see, in the 20 meter band, you s we found out that it was 300 baud. So you'd think, uh, maybe it jumps up to 1,200 baud. And we're talking about frequencies below 28 megahertz. So we're talking about below 10 meters. The maximum symbol rate. Yeah. Permitted. So I'm going to hang with 300 baud. I think it's still 300 baud. And that's, that's what, what most of the chat room is saying as yeah. well. Well, let's see. There okay. we go. 300 baud. So... Um, that that is your dividing line right there. That's one of your dividing lines. It is right there. Anything below twenty eight megahertz, three hundred baud. So let's go on to the next one. I got a feeling it's going to be kind of like the last two. What is the maximum symbol rate permitted for RIDI or data emission transmissions on the two meter band? Is it A fifty six kilobaud? B, 19.6 kilobaud. C, 1,200 baud. Or D, 300 baud. Hmm. And let's see, two meter band. I'm, I'm going to jump up on this one. Again, this is a guess. 
I'm going to jump up to, I'm going to try B on that one, although that seems kind of high. You know, we used to try a 9600 baud packet, and it worked okay. Yeah, I never had a 9600 baud modem. I had a 2400 baud, but I knew 9600 was, it, most of the newer radios would do that. Um, if you had a TNC for it. I don't remember nineteen point six though, but uh No, I don't I don't either, but I don't see uh anything above twelve hundred baud there, so I know twenty four hundred baud was quite popular. Yeah. So, so um I'm gonna I'm gonna jump up the the next one in line there and say it's nineteen six. I think fifty six K is too high. Just a just a guess. All right. Well they mm, there's a lot of C's in there in the chat room to twelve hundred baud I'm going to go with you, though. I think it's 19.6. I could be wrong. We may have a double buzzer go off here. Let's see. Well, I got here. lucky on that yeah, one. Yeah, we, we need a fist bump on that one right there. Oops. Wrong way. Yeah. Sure. I... <laughs> oh, well. That one is, um, we did, well, we kind of got lucky on it, but... Reason well, it out. You know, well, you know, twenty four hundred baud's been done all over two meters. So, yeah, that couldn't have been the limit, and and it's not on there, so it only makes sense to try the next one up. Yeah, and but you and I would remember that because we were around during the days when packet was pretty popular, and and we knew that when we bought our TNCs, <laughs> what baud rates they are. Someone yeah. new coming in now, you know, they may never have. Uh, you know, really experience that, but you think about that nineteen point six kilobaud. That's still probably less than you could do with a dial-up modem in most cases. Oh yeah. So. Um, That'd be interesting to see it going that fast. Well, you got one for me. I do. What is the maximum symbol rate permitted for ready or data transmissions on the ten meter band? Isn't that the same thing we just did? A, 56 kilobaud. B, 19.6 kilobaud. C, 1200 baud. Or D, 300 baud. Well, uh, no, what we said a moment ago was... Uh, 28 megahertz. Yeah, anything below 28. The, okay. the 10 That's meter fine. band is 28, you know up i mean it starts at 28 so based on that i know it's going to be faster than 300 baud i know it's not 56k baud and i don't think it's 19.6 i don't believe so i think it's 1200 baud and uh everybody's saying 1200 baud over in in the chat room what do you think tommy i i think that's right just to guess, I think it's right. Well, let's see. Yep. Okay. 1,200 baud. So that one wasn't too hard to figure out there. Uh, but we've got a tough one coming up next. And I'm glad that it falls on you. So Great. Yeah. Get the buzzer out again. The buzzer's going to get kind of, it'll be shiny after we use it so much tonight. <laughs> Get the dust all off of it. What is the maximum symbol rate permitted for RIDI or data emission transmitted on the 1.25 meter and 70 centimeter bands? Is it A, 56 kilobaud? B, 19.6 kilobaud? C, 1200 baud? Or D, 300 baud? Well, I'm going to take a guess just by process of elimination of what we've covered so far. Mm -hmm. And 70 centimeters is typically good for really clean, short communications. And so I'm going to say it's up, up to 56 kilobaud just, uh, just because the, the two meters was 19.6 and the last one I did earlier. And so I'm going to go with 56K. I okay. don't know if it's right, again, just like the others, but I'm just a uh, process of elimination. That's the one I think might be the answer. All right. They're all saying A over in the chat room. 
Uh, but let's let's just look at that real quick before we reveal the, the real answer there. 1.25 okay. meters, that's going to be in the 220 band. Mm -hmm. And 70 centimeters, that's going to be 440 megahertz band. Um, you, you know, the thing really that determines how much uh, baud rate you're allowed on these different bands has got a lot to do with how crowded that band is, which could mean how many people use it, as well as how much bandwidth do we have in that particular band. If we've got a, a large you know, slice of bandwidth in there and there's not a lot of people on it, we're, you know, we're going to be allowed higher baud rates on those bands. So we're going up in frequency. And 70 centimeters is a pretty, pretty broad band. Yeah. So I'm inclined to think 56 kilobaud, but uh, I think I'm going to hold back and say 19.6. But it's your question, so... Oh, so we have a split decision. Yeah. Uh, and it's... Okay. You know, there are... Somebody else is with me there in the... the now you're almost too. making me want to rethink it. But the other one for two meters was 19.6, so I'm thinking they're going to try... I'm thinking this is the other one, so I, I'm still going to think it's 56K. All right. Well, let's find out. Uh, yeah. You're right. Oh, you got buzzed. Well, you, you almost. If it had been my it question. Your question. Yep. Well, I didn't realize that, you know, um, because I was thinking, you know, 1.25 meters, that's 220 megahertz. That's not very high above two meters. No. So. Not a lot. No, not a lot. But it's not a real popular band either. No, it's especially not. Especially around our part of the country. No. Oh, this is an easy one. What part of a data packet contains the routing and handling information? A, directory. B, preamble. C, header. Or D, footer. Well, what part of a data packet contains the routing and handling information? Well, I know it's going to be the very first of it. It's, so it's definitely not going to be the footer. That's at the end of the... It's not the directory because I don't think there's part of a data packet called a directory. No. Uh, so it's either going to be the preamble or the header. And both of those sound like they're at the first of it. So it's got to be one of those two. But I think when you're talking about packets, the word preamble is not in there. So I think it's going to be the header. I'm going to say C, and that's everybody saying that in the chat room. Yep, yep. I concur. Well, let's see. It is. Yeah, you've written enough software that that one kind of makes sense to you, but it, it might not to a lot of people that aren't familiar with it. So, well, that's the that's the very per very first of the data that gets sent and. You know, your yeah. software is going to read that and determine what has to happen with what's following it. But you could almost think it was preamble if you didn't know the term was header, because that means the first two. Yeah. You know, so. yeah, it does. It does. And we'll be back in just a moment. Spring is in the air. Check out ICOM's line of D-Star radios. ICOM offers a variety of high-performance and innovative products, and you can stay connected around the world with ICOM's D-Star radios, ICOM's newest D-Star handheld is ready for the season ahead. Lightweight, compact, and tough, the new ID31A Plus is a great choice for any shack or those in harsh environments. 70 centimeters, analog and digital, terminal mode, access point mode, and its IPX waterproof rating. The ICOM ID51A Plus 2 provides extended D-Star coverage, allowing you to listen to whatever you want. Terminal and access mode, send and receive text messages and pictures, DV fast data mode, and easy FM repeater setting. The compact and user-friendly ID4100A is a D-Star mobile with big rig features. Its intuitive interface, 
variety of operating modes, and Bluetooth capability make this the preferred D-Star option for those on the go. Integrated GPS receiver, new dot matrix display for enhanced DR mode and GPS information, terminal mode and access point mode, applications for iOS and Android devices, and there's a micro SD card slot for voice and data storage. ICOM's ID5100A has taken innovation and mobility to the next level. With its touchscreen and internal GPS, this radio is a must-have while assessing a situation. 5.5-inch display responds naturally to the touch. DVDV Dual Watch receives both FM-FM and FM-DV modes simultaneously. VS-3 Bluetooth headset provides hands-free communications. And you can show your position, course, and speed with the integrated GPS receiver. Learn more about D-Star today. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur. Tommy, I've got a nice hat here. Yeah, looks, just put it on top of the TV. Yeah, looks looks good on you. Well, it'll probably fall off the TV's too skinny. <laughs> and I'm going to give this to somebody, too. At, along with, well, we got something else to go with it. What is that? Oh, a nice ICOM ham crew t-shirt. Looks looks good yeah, on you, looks, too. Fits great. Yeah. <laughs> so, the pair, and, and you're, as you always mention, it's on the front and the back. Yeah, you'll look just as good coming as you will leaving. <laughs> if you'd like to win this, uh, what do you need to do? Well, you need to send an email in to hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv. All we need is your name. That's all we need, your name. Yep. Um, you don't have to have a call sign. You don't have to do anything special, just your name. And uh, send it to the address you got on your screen right there, and you'll be uh, in, in the drawing. And the winner will get contacted by ICOM, and your email address will get thrown away after that, and they're not harvested or used for any other purposes. Nope. As a matter of fact, here's the name right here without a call sign. He may have one, but he didn't put it in the email if he, if he did, and that doesn't matter because you don't need to have a call sign to win this contest. It's uh, Rodney Huff, and he said, Hi, guys, just putting my name in. And that's all you got to do, Rodney. Congratulations. You're going to be. It was effective. Yep. Yeah, congratulations, Rodney. You're going to be receiving a Ham College t shirt. Well, actually, well, it's, it's a, a Ham it's Crew. It's actually an ICOM t shirt. Yeah, it's Ham Crew on it, which, yeah. which we're part of the Ham Crew as well at Ham College, and the hat, Tommy Martin style. <laughs> so if you want to win next month, well, just go drop us an email there. Somebody's going to win it. You can stick a little note in there with it. Tell us you're throwing your name in the hat or, or whatever you want to tell us, pretty much, and your name. And you got to have an email address, too, so that we know how to contact you. And uh, thanks, ICOM, for sponsoring us here on Ham College. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Really appreciate those guys. I know you really missed the digital questions during that break, so we've got a couple more here. Well, oh, actually, yay. before we do that, uh, we got an event coming up that you and I are going to be at next weekend. We'll be at, uh, it's called Triple D Plus One. It's D-Star Day down in Lafayette, Louisiana. It's put on by Acadiana Amateur Radio Association, the same ones that did the uh, Brain Ham Fest that we were at a few months. Well, I guess that was about a month back, wasn't it? Yeah, right. Anyway, uh, they're going to have lots of experts there. It's going to be on May the 5th at 9 a.m. at the Lafayette Science Museum on Jefferson Street in Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, prizes are going to be an ID 5100A Deluxe, uh, ID 4100A, and an ID-51A. So we've got some really great prizes. They're also going to have some great food there. They've got jambalaya and pasta laya on the menu. Uh, got some great speakers there. Some uh, Basically a who's who in the D-Star world. There's going to be a lot of good topics. Of course, uh, Delta Division, uh, welcome from the Louisiana section. Uh, welcome as well from ARRL. Uh, the life cycle of D-Star. There's going to be 
information there on G1, 2, and 3. Um, the quick key net, uh, how, how do you log it? There'll be information on that. Uh, DRATs, uh, emails in an emergency. Uh, the Georgia Emergency Management Agency, uh, how we roll, and they're big users of DSTAR. Uh, DSTARinfo.com, repeater directories, and uh, other things about DSTAR, and a lot about DSTAR in the area down there. You know, it's kind of um, popular down in South Louisiana after, oh, yeah. after the hurricanes they've had. It's, you know, they've gotten pretty serious about it down there. It should be a great time. I'm really looking forward to going. Um, we're going to be streaming it uh, if you can't make it, but mm -hmm. I really encourage you to come in person. Um, anyway, it should be a really fun time. Yeah, and um, you can watch the stream live, uh, well, I guess next Saturday morning at uh, 9 a.m. Central. Uh, right here. Right here. Th at this link. Yep, live.amateurlogic.tv. All right, well, back into the questions here. Which of the following is the FCC term for an unattended digital station that transfers messages to and from the Internet? Is it A, locally controlled station? B, robotically controlled station? C, automatically controlled digital station? Or D, fail-safe digital station? Uh, that's some tough, tough huh? names. That's some tough names there. Yeah, um, the term for an unattended digital station that transfers messages to and from the internet transfers messages. So fail-safe digital station. I I don't think that's it. Uh, automatically controlled digital station, uh, maybe. B, robotically controlled station, robotically. Uh, I don't think that's it either. And locally, unattended digital station, lo not locally. So uh, it's got to be C, automatically controlled digital station. Well, that is what everyone's saying over in the chat room. Mostly everyone said it was a C. You know, that one just didn't come to me right off when I was looking at the questions and and entering them in here. And I thought, I wonder what Gordo has to say about this topic. And it's just fortunate that I happen to have uh, Gordo's General Class Amateur Radio Study Guide. How convenient, that right? That was handy. Yeah, with all these notes flagged in it. Came from Gordo this way. Now, I can't guarantee that your copy will come with the notes flagged in it. But uh, this one did. Gordo says that Echolink and IRLP are two very popular internet to amateur radio technologies. The radio transmitter receiver or repeater involved in the system is known as an automatically controlled digital station. So that would be C. Okay. All right. And he says in this case there are actually two control operators responsible for legal operation. The distant internet computer uh, operator, as well as the amateur who communicates to the RF side of the link. Uh, while you may not think of yourself as a radio operator, if you're sitting at a computer thousands of miles away from the actual transmitter, you are ultimately responsible for the transmissions of that remote station. So something good to keep in mind if if you're using Echolink or IRLP or or really, um, you know, any of the the digital uh, voice over IP services there for amateur radio, you you, you got to treat it just like you're on the air transmitting because there's a good chance you, you are somewhere. Yeah, yeah, you're responsible for that for sure. So thanks for those words of wisdom there, Gordo. And, well, we got... I'm going to say one more digital question. Again? One more again? One more again. Yep. <laughs> and you can ask me this one. Okay, I think I will. On what bands may automatically control digital 
controlled stations transmit, transmitting RIDI or data emissions communicate with other automatically controlled digital stations. A, on any band segment where digital operation is permitted. B, anywhere in the non-phone segment of the 10 meter or shorter wavelength bands. C, only in the non-phone extra class segments of the band. Uh, D, anywhere in the 1.2 meter or shorter wavelength band and in specified segments of the 80 meter through 2 meter bands. Oh, hmm. I'm so glad you got this one and not me. This is a, a, a tough one. On what bands may automatically control stations transmitting RIDI or data emissions communicate with other automatically controlled digital stations. On any band segment where digital operation is permitted. You know, I'd almost want to say that. Uh, let's see, B, anywhere in the non-phone segments of the 10 meter or shorter wavelength bands. I'd almost want to say that. Only in the non-phone extra class segments of the bands. No, I don't think that's it. Anywhere in the 1.25 meter or shorter wavelengths and in specified segments of the 80 meter through 2 meter bands. I'm going to go with that. I think it's, it's either A or D. And I'm going to go with D. And then they're, they're guessing A and D in the chat room. So D seems kind of comp anywhere in the 1.25 meter or shorter wavelength bands. Or shorter. Yeah. And in specified segments of the 80 meter through 2 meter. Okay. I, I'm not sure I'd have picked that one, but go ahead. No, well, let's see. Oh, you got it. Yeah, barely. <laughs> uh, that was kind of a tough one. Um. Yeah, and I, I I would have thought it would have been A. Well, and that's you know I almost thought it was A. Anyway, D. Well, that was interesting. Yet yeah, tough. You got uh, 220 megahertz and up. Just pick a frequency and you're good to go. But only in specified segments on 80 through two meters. So that's enough digital questions for this week, and I think yeah. we. We've I've, got I've had enough. I think we've got more for next week. <laughs> you know... Next month? Next month. They really, in this uh, latest version of the general test, I think they've really doubled up on the digital questions that are on there. Uh, just because, you know, it's a big part of amateur radio these days. Yeah, it is. It, I, it's really... It's really uh, Kind of a cool time to be a ham because of all that stuff. It's a lot of things that were never possible before you yeah. can do now because of digital technology. So it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, I just but the purest stuff is still there too. You know, if you want, if you're into the old analog, something for everybody. Yep. You, you know, I um, I just don't think we had all these digital questions on there when you and I took our general exams back in the fifties. I, I don't fifties. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember them back in the early nineties. I don't. Not, not all of them. I remember a few really things on there. Yeah, I don't think we took our general exams in the early nineties. I didn't when, take when, mine. No. Well, when did we do the general? I don't remember what year it was. Now. Well, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look back. It feels like feels like the sixties. Well, I know I wasn't a general when we started Amateur Logic, so I know it was less than 13 years ago. Oh, yeah? Yep. I guess that's, that's right. We sure weren't. Yep. So what do you say we move on to some, uh, some technical questions that aren't digital related but are more analog? Okay. How, Let's go for it. How about HF antennas? Do you want to talk about okay. that tonight? Well, that sounds like a good topic. Okay. Well, you better get your calculator out and get it sharpened up, because you might need it on this next one. I'm going to have to cheat and do like uh, 
use my phone, not not like at the test because I don't have any other one here. Okay. <laughs> well, here is the question, and you may know the answer to this one without doing the calculations. What is the approximate length of a half wave dipole antenna cut for 3.550 megahertz? Is it A, 42 feet? Uh, B, 84 feet. C, 131 feet. Or D, 263 feet. Um, that one's going to be, I think that's going to be 131 feet. But I can check it with the calculator if, you, if we should. 468 divided by the frequency in megahertz. That's one of the formulas I actually remember. 131 point something. So it was C. C. Number C. C. And we got some C's and B's over in the chat room. But yeah, I'm going to go with you just because I happen to know, you know, that's uh, 80 meter antenna. Or yeah, actually, I, I remember the meters. approximate length anyways. But I, yeah. Only because I built a few of them. If if you didn't have your general license yet, though, there's a good chance you may not know the answer to that one because right. it isn't something you would think about very often. Yeah, so that, remember that formula is a good thing. Um, you'll you'll probably always want to remember that one if you ever end up building your own HF antennas. Yeah, and we've actually talked about this exact formula at probably more than once as uh, back when we were doing the technician right. exam studies. So you'll want that one, 468 divided by the frequency in megahertz. What is the approximate length for a half-wave dipole antenna cut for 14.250 megahertz? A, 8 feet. B, 16 feet. C, 24 feet. Or D, 32 feet. All right, a half-wave dipole cut for 14.250. Well, if I pulled up my calculator sitting over here on the side, I think I'll use the formula 468 divided by, if I can get to my divided by key here, 14.250. And I would say it's, um, well, I got 32.842. 32 feet's the closest answer there. So I'm going to say it's D, Tommy. Yep. The calculator doesn't lie. Most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> if you drive it right. Yeah. Yeah, if you drive it right. So 32 feet. There's your answer. And that everybody, well, there was some debate there in the chat room on that one. Um, but, you know, I kind of knew that one just because I know that uh, f my 40 meter antenna out there is, you know, probably close to 60 feet, you know, in that neighborhood. And 20 meter antenna would be half of that. So, uh, 32 feet, best answer on that. Okay, we've got some more, and these are going to be a little bit tougher here, and we're going to have some splaining to do on them. Okay. And But first, I think, you know, everybody needs to probably stretch their legs and, I don't know, maybe, maybe think about how you want to study for your next ham exam. And there might be a little Easter egg in here, too. Okay, I have to watch for that now. Are you new to the ham world or an existing amateur operator who wants to take your license to the next level? Study for your radio license exam at hamstudy.org. Hamstudy.org is a free online learning tool powered by ICOM. It was created by Richard Bateman, KD7BBC, Michael Stuffelbean, KV9G, and Rich Porter, KK6GKE, and it uses a modern web design to enhance the experience of studying for your technician, general, and amateur extra exams. 
Since 2013, hamstudy.org has helped new and existing hams to familiarize themselves with the question pools, use stats-based flashcards to focus on material they need to learn, and take practice exams to gauge progress. Visit hamstudy.org on your desktop computer or mobile device. Register for a free account at hamstudy.org to access personalized study history and other site features. Prepare for an exam in an intuitive and comprehensive manner. Check out hamstudy.org, powered by ICOM, for free learning tools. Good luck on your next exam. When Pressman toy makers looking for something new, the secret they brought back for you is incredible. The Pressman Witch Doctor Head Shrinkers Kit. Plastic flesh, mixing cauldron and petrifying potion. Just pour it into the mold and in minutes you can add monster hair. Paint it with a coloring kit included or make up your own decorations. In 24 hours, the heads shrink, shrink down. Now, shrunken heads for all occasions. Collect them, swap them, give them to your witch doctor friends. You can always cook up more with Pressman's Witch Doctor Head Shrinkers Kit. There's only a few questions left, but like I said, these are going to be a little bit tougher. So... To help in that, I am going to make uh, I'm going to make it even tougher than it was to start with, because we needed to explain some of these or try to explain them. And I am a very poor artist. I'll be the first one to admit it. But it's even worse the first day you ever try to do it on a digital tablet, which <laughs> is what I'm going to try to do here. So uh, just just bear with us on this. Uh, sure, the artwork is going to be horrible. Uh, you know, you might want to tighten up your seatbelt just a little bit on it. But hopefully we can explain um, some of the concepts here that we're about to cover. So our next question here, I don't even remember who answered the last one. I think I did. So I'm going to ask you this one, Tommy. Which of the following is an advantage of a horizontally polarized as compared to a vertically polarized HF antenna? Is it A, lower ground reflection losses? B, lower feed point impedance? C, shorter radials? Or D, lower radiation resistance? Hmm. Which of the following is the advantage of a horizontally polarized as compared to vertically polarized. My gut's telling me B, but I'm going to go with A, I think. You got it. Oh, okay. Yep. And I will just, uh, I'll say the, the one, one clue in this one here, switch of the following is an advantage. Is it, yeah, that's yeah. So, is there an advantage to having a lower feed point impedance? Not really. I yeah, mean, I don't, well, I, and that's why I went with A. Yeah, because I think it is. Are shorter radials an advantage? Not, not really. Is uh, lower radiation resistance? Uh, not here. So, yeah, lower ground reflection losses. Yeah. Uh, now, to try to explain that, down here at the bottom, we got the ground. If we put up a horizontal antenna, that's going to go horizontally this way. And we're further away from the ground uh, when we do it this way. However, if we do a vertical antenna... It's going up like this. So, you know, this antenna is closer to the ground right here. 
we have to actually, on a vertical, we actually have to put some ground radials down there if it's a ground-mounted one. There's going to be losses there involved in that. Now, there are advantages to a vertical antenna. One of the advantages might be the takeoff angle on it, but that wasn't one of our possible answers there. With a horizontal antenna up there, there's going to be less of the signal coming off of that reflected on the ground than there would be on a vertical. All right, let's go to the, the next one here. You can ask me this one. Okay. Which of the following antenna types will be most effective for skip communications on 40 meters during the day? A, a vertical antenna. B, a horizontal dipole placed between one-eighth and one-quarter wavelength above the ground. C, a left-hand circularly polarized antenna. Or D, a right-hand circularly polarized antenna. Well, um, let's go over this. Which of the following antenna types will be the most effective for skip communications on 40 meters during the day? Skip, okay. Uh, on 40 meters, a vertical antenna. Well, I know vertical antennas can be good for uh, a low takeoff angle. So I would lean that way a little bit. A horizontal dipole placed between one eighth and one and quarter wavelength above the ground. That's a possible answer. A left handed or a right handed circularly polarized antenna. I think that's kind of crazy talk on 40 meters. I don't ever recall seeing a circularly polarized antenna much less left or right-handed. Not for that size. Not they much. use them on drones a lot for video. Yeah, but, but on 40 meters, that'd be a pretty good size antenna to be trying to yeah. uh, make circularly polarized. So, uh, you know, I almost wanted to say vertical on here, but I know, uh, or at least I believe the answer is B, a horizontal dipole placed between one eighth and one quarter wavelength above the ground and yeah there's a's and b's you know coming up on the chat room over here so this this is uh kind of a tough one let's see it actually is a horizontal dipole placed between one eighth and a quarter wavelength above the ground i, I guess i'll go ahead and say it now a horizontal dipole you know, the closer you put that to the ground, the more your radiation is going to go straight up. It'd be reflected off the ground and go straight back up. If you want it to go at an angle to, to catch skip, then you need to raise that antenna up some so that the angle of the radiation is not all going up. It, it kind of goes at an angle where it can hit and skip back down further out. Um, a vertical antenna, hmm, I, I would have really thought that that could be the answer, but apparently it's a horizontal dipole placed between one-eighth and a quarter. And, you know, an eighth of a wavelength above the ground is not really a good height to put a horizontal dipole antenna. Yeah. But apparently... I, that, that's my problem where I am. I can't get mine up high enough uh, so it doesn't perform as well as I would like. Yep. So uh, that's the answer to that one right there. Um, and that's all you have to say about that? That's all I have to say about that. Raise that thing up, you're going to do better with skip. Lower it down, you're going to do better with close end stations. Okay, next question here. And I will ask you this. How does the feed point impedance of a half-wave dipole change as the feed point is moved from the center toward the ends? A, it steadily increases. B, it steadily decreases. C, it peaks at about one-eighth wavelength from the end. Or D, 
it is unaffected by the location of the feed point. Okay, so this one, this one I, I'm going to come clean because I kind of looked at this one the other night when we were trying to figure out a demonstration. So I was trying to understand, you know, about it to try to come up with it. It still didn't. And I, I'm not totally sure I even really remember the answer, but I'm, I think it was A, that it increases. But I'm going to be honest with you. If, if that's the right one, I don't know the reason why. And I, I wish I did. But uh, I didn't get a chance to find find it. Okay. Well, they're kind of they're a little mixed in the chat room. Most of them are saying it's a. I think it, I think it was a, but I, I don't I don't really know this this one. I'm yeah. only saying that because I like I said when we were looking for a lesson um, to go with the show, I kind of that's one of the ones that I'd look to try to figure out something to do on. Well, I believe I can show a good way to remember why it's. The answer okay. that it is. But first, let's see what that is. And it's A. It steadily increases. So my memory wasn't totally faulty. Not Just completely. Just my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me, <laughs> let me do a crude stick man drawing here on this one, too. Going to talk about a horizontal dipole antenna. That means we got... A wire going that way, we got a wire going that way. Right here in the middle is where we tap in, and that's our feed point. So we've got one lead that goes down. Let's say we're using coax, so that's a center conductor. Uh, this will be our shield right here, and of course the way you draw that is like that. So one leg is attached there on the left of the antenna uh, to the center conductor. The other leg of the antenna is attached to the shield. And you put that in the middle right there and you call that a half wave dipole. Now actually what you've got is a quarter wavelength of that is on one side and then there's a quarter wavelength on the other side as well. Put it all together you got a half wavelength. You're supposed to be able to take it and feed this antenna directly with a piece of 50 ohm coax. We're, we're going to say it's 50 ohms if we feed it in the center. Now, here's how you can think about it. Take another half wavelength of wire, stretch it out here, but let's put more of it on one side than we put on the other side. And let's connect it up the same way. We got our center conductor, we got our shield here. Same kind of connections we had before, but if we hook it up like this, it's it's still a half wave altogether, but let's say maybe we put uh, two-thirds of it on one side, and so we'll only have a third of it on the other side. That'll still radiate at that frequency that, you know, that this antenna was cut for. However, that feed point impedance changes, and when it was in the middle here, you know, we had... Uh, 50 ohms or, you know, close. If we move it to one edge or the other, that impedance is increasing. Actually, what it's going to be out here, well, rather than 50 ohms, it's going to be increasing there. Let's say it goes up to 400 ohms right there. Now, it's still going to radiate at this frequency and be resonant that frequency, but the feed point impedance is going to be higher. Well, how do you handle that? Right here in the center, bring our two leads down from it. We put a magical device in there called a ballon. A ballon? Yep. And then our coax hooks to the bottom of it and goes on in, and that's our 50 ohm coax going on into the shack. This particular ballon that we're going to use here, let's say we use a, uh, a 4 to 1 ballon. Okay. That means on... On one side of that ballon, it, it's going to be uh, whatever it is, and the other end is going to be a quarter of that, or you can reverse that, and you can say whatever the impedance is on this side, it's going to be four times that on the other side. If it's 50 ohms down here, four times that, 200 ohms on this side. So 200 divided by four, 
would give us 50 ohms. Uh, if you're, you know, if the impedance right here happened to be 300 ohms, you'd want a 6 to 1 ball. And then I, I see a lot of off-center fed dipoles, and that's basically what we've drawn yeah. here. Yeah, that's what mine actually called for. Yeah. Uh, a, it, six, it, mm -hmm. hmm? a 6 to 1 is what, what they recommend there in the design, but most people probably use a 4 to 1 in it. It still works good enough. Yeah, that's what I used a four to one. Yeah. So but the, it did call for a six. The thing to keep in mind is although, you know, this is a half wavelength, it'll still radiate. The feed point impedance is going to be so far off that you're going to have to use a tuner in there or some way to match it. In this case, we use a ballon to match it, to transform that impedance down to the impedance that we want to see. Okay, next question here. How does the feed point impedance of a half-wave dipole antenna change as the antenna is lowered below what quarter wave above the ground? A, it steadily increases. B, it steadily decreases. C, it peaks at about one-eighth wavelength above ground. D, it is unaffected by the height above ground. Well, I think we can rule out some of those automatically. Um, starting at D there, it's unaffected by the height above ground. No, that's not true. If you, if you change the height of that horizontal antenna, you are changing the impedance when you do that, not just the takeoff angle of the antenna. Um, you're changing the impedance as well. Um, so it's not D, certainly. C, it peaks at about one-eighth wavelength. Why would it peak at one-eighth wavelength above the ground, you know? That, uh, I don't, you know, that doesn't really make sense to me. So it's either going to be A, it steadily increases, or B, it steadily decreases. And I'm going to say it steadily decreases. The closer we get that antenna to the ground, um, the feed point impedance is going to decrease. What do you think, Tommy? Well, that's one that I was thinking too, but again, this is because uh, I peaked the other night when we were looking for a topic. So um, it's hard not to when you're doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it, if I remember right, I believe it was B also. I don't know the, I don't really know the answer why. Well, most everybody over in the chat room is saying A, so we might ought to get that buzzer ready. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. It's B. Got your, got your ink pencil out so you can show us why? I got my ink pencil out, and I got it sharpened up. And uh, I'm not sure I can really show you exactly why, but I can show you why I think it is. We got the ground sitting down here at the bottom. And then we've got a horizontal antenna up here. And I'm not going to draw the feed point in it because it really doesn't matter. But this is our antenna up here. Okay. When this thing is up high right here, say a quarter wavelength or better, certain distance from the ground there, there will be some reflection losses and uh, some absorption going on with the ground. The further we've got it away from the ground, the less that effect's going to be. Uh, when we bring that thing closer to the ground, though, like, say, down here, now more of that signal is, is going to be affected by, by the ground that's down here below us. And that's going to drop the impedance of it. The lower the antenna, the lower the impedance when we're talking about horizontals. The higher the antenna, the higher the impedance. You know, it's a coupling effect into the ground there, and that's affecting the impedance because you're, you're changing the, the match of the antenna a little bit when you do that. Uh, Marty says it sounds good to him. If it sounds good to Marty... Um, if it's good for Marty, it's good for me too then. So count me in. Thanks for being here. Next Amateur Logic coming up on the 15th of next month as usual. We don't know what we're going to do yet. You'll just have to show up and see.
<laughs> like us. Like usual. Yeah. Yeah. So appreciate y'all joining us this evening. It's 73. All right, 73. Okay. Because I know you're looking forward to this particular one. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that's about, but it. I think this has happened. That happened to us last before. time too.